this on the right? Oh. Great, so oh, let me get this right. Okay, so good morning to all of you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me to be here in your midst. Uh, I think the sound will go away. Yeah, so it's a great joy for me to be here with all of you. You know, I just wanted to correct three things about my introduction. One is, I think one got self-corrected. One is, <laughs> my daughter's name is Misha, you know, not Melissa. We are, we are not praying for another one uh, who we should name Melissa. So we are, we are happy and uh, content and joyful with one child. Yeah, that's, that's one. Two, it's not Khargar, it's Khargar. Okay, and so that's <laughs> the place I come from. In November, I think Karan corrected the other one. It's 18 years uh, that we know each other. and but, but it's really such a joy, you know. I mean, I remember the first time I came uh, to be a part of the Pune church was for its west, very first service. Uh, and it was happening in Karan's house. And it was just a simple Bible study. And, and I had the pleasure of, you know, conducting that Bible study. So to see this church from where it was uh, to where it is now, is such a great joy. And so kudos to Karan Esther, the leadership team here. You all have done a great job. It's it's so great to see so many young people here all, you know, enjoying the presence of the Lord, enjoying doing church together. Uh, I've known Karan and Esther, like, what's his name, sorry? Devakar said, you know, for, for 18 years. And and it's, it's really been a, a journey of great friendship that we have shared over the years. Uh, we have known each other very closely. Uh, we've been able to talk with each other about you know, almost every aspect of our life, we've seen each other's highs, we've seen each other's lows, we've, but we've journeyed together. Uh, we've also been, I think Karan has been a great inspiration to me in, in many ways. Uh, it's good that I had a friend like Karan in my early years and my journey, because being friends with Karan helped me also say that I want to be passionate for the Lord, you know, and so he has been able to have that influence upon me. And so I am, part, part of the reason why I am here today is because of that. You know, many say that us, we are like brothers. We, you know, some people confuse us to be blood brothers. Uh, in that sense, also because we share the same surname uh, of having Thomas, you know, but, uh, but we have been like brothers itself. So that's, that's one good thing. Uh, one different thing about this church over here is, I think the stage is quite well lit up. Uh, the congregation seems to be in the dark. Uh, so, so in case you decide to go to sleep, uh, you have my permission. Only please do not snore. Okay, so so that would be uh, one respect for us over here. All right. So so it's a joy, like I said, uh, to be able to do, to share today's word with you. Uh, I'll, what I'll be sharing is from a book called The Sonship Manual. And I'll, I'll be taking a topic called Receive Righteousness. But before I go there, I is the PPT up? Uh, should I just press this? Oh, great. Okay. So that's there. And I just thought I'll just show you my family. Uh, I mean, that's my wife over there. Her name is Anubhuti. And you can see my daughter as well, uh, Misha. And so that's just a glimpse. They wanted to be here today, but uh, my daughter's exams are going on, and so they couldn't come. So their apologies. They do send their greetings uh, for you here today. Now, as we look into this topic, you know, it's called Received Righteousness. Now, I'm given to understand you all have probably heard about this topic in different ways, or at least have got a concept of this uh, as you've journeyed as a church together, you know. And so today I thought it's good we dwell on this because this is something we need to hear about again and again. You know, it's not something we can get tired of uh, hearing. The more we hear it, the better for us. In fact, that's how Paul, you know, was in his gospel, in his epistles. He kept reminding the people of the gospel. Now, let me just give you some, you know, I wanted to give this to you all a week ago. I missed it, uh, but but nonetheless, you know, we've I've tried doing this in our own church in Kargar. When we were doing this topic, you know, one week before the sermon, you know, we gave them this assignment. Okay, it said for one week, they cannot gossip or spread a bad report about anyone, even in prayer. So that's that's not allowed. You know, secondly, uh, they were told do not complain for a week. Thirdly, do not criticize anyone, even if their work, even at the workplace, even if their work is not up to the standard. So do not criticize at all. Fourthly, do not blame shift or make excuses, even if you're married. Yeah, that, that's not something you can do. Uh, fifthly, do not defend yourself, even if you're wrongly accused. For one week, 
do not defend yourself sixth do not boast even if you have done a job very well do not boast and seventh do not deceive others okay so this was the assignment we gave our church members and we said for one week just don't do these things how do you think we performed so today we are the best church in all of india <laughs> no i'm just kidding you know i mean I, i we took away the best mix of things that was supposed to be done here you know but when we came back and we were we were sharing you know what we realized interestingly is that we couldn't keep even one of them forget seven of them even one of them was so difficult to kind of follow and obey over here you know and and what i want to this is not just a made up assignment these things are commanded in scripture okay based on scripture we are supposed to refrain from doing these things and i have not even mentioned the things that we are supposed to do in our speech you know there is this place a whole aspect where you are supposed to witness uh, you are supposed to affirm and encourage others you are supposed to express thanks and praise now this assignment like i said is taken from a book called the sonship manual and they have conducted this assignment in many other places as well and so they did it among a group of pastors in russia okay and so when they had given them this assignment again for a week they were not supposed to do all these things and they came back after a week now among that group there was one pastor by the name of ivan and he was a very interesting fellow he was very determined and so on so after one week when they all came back and the preacher asked so how did it go how was the assignment you know and everybody was looking at ivan you know and, and everybody was smiling you know and ivan also had this very you know what do you say a very proud you know look upon his face and so the preacher knew there is something fishy and so he asked ivan how did it go and so he said i kept it i kept it and so the preacher was surprised he said how did you do it you know i don't know a single person we have done this across the world and i have not met a single person who's been able to keep this how did you manage to do it he said i didn't speak for one week you know and uh, you know and so of course like you laughed they also laughed and you know it became a good joke over there now the point of this assignment is to show us that we need a righteousness that is not our own we all need a righteousness that is not our own because in our own strength in all our effort in all our endeavor in all that we try to do we can't even do this much and this does not even comprise what percentage of the commands in the bible you know to just do this much is difficult even for a week i i bet even if we were to do this for a day it would be tough it would be quite challenging you know and so we all look for in some ways some form of righteousness you know even in christian life don't we you know when like say for example if we do our quiet time today do we feel better about ourselves yes thank you for being honest yeah if we finish our prayer time in addition to our quiet time you would feel better yeah now suppose your church attendance and punctuality to church is also good you don't reach church late any time you are regular you know 100% attendance to church to all meetings even cell church this church you know all those things even choir practice and so on suppose you are active in ministry and you have and you do service to others would you feel even better you would feel better you know if you have now that you are active if you find success in ministry does that make you feel even more better yeah when you see a church growing when you see new people being added when you see uh, the sermon being responded to very well all that makes you feel good now if you have success as a father or a mother or as a husband and wife that is even more of a plus point you know you're making efforts to do all these things and these things do make you feel better if you're an employee at work and your performance is good that again makes you feel better doesn't it and so you see in some ways evidences of a works based lifestyle because when we succeed at these things we do feel better now when we do our quiet time are we supposed to feel good now some are wondering it's a trick question or not you know you are supposed to feel good you know when you are in the presence of the lord it is supposed to bless you you know uh, but is it supposed to make you proud no you know many a times when we tick that box we feel better because we are 
proud of an accomplishment. Not because we are blessed in that time. Of course, we are blessed in that time. But to add to it, there can be pride that comes in. So every box that we tick, good husband, good father, good wife, good mother, and all those things, good worker, uh, you know, good witness, and so on, you know, we do see that we tend to puff up in pride because those things are helping us accomplish some things. Now, in churches also, we see some kind of signs of works-based culture. Uh, in some churches, dress code is a big thing. You're supposed to dress up in a certain way. You know, there is mandatory tithing in some places. Yeah. So, so which means when they give a tithe, it's not because they, they want to do it out of love, but because if they don't, the pastor will call them. Correct? So, I'm giving my tithe because I want to tick a box. You know, for some people, tithing becomes a big challenge. You know, and they say it is an Old Testament thing. You know, not a New Testament thing. Fair enough. But let's, let's compare both the co covenants. There was an Old Covenant and there is a New Covenant. Is the New Covenant better? Yes, no. Uh, I think you are not very sure. All right. So, is the New Covenant better? Should it result in better giving? Should it be restricted to 10%? The confidence is going down. Okay, that's fine. You know, uh, th you know there, are, there are places I know when I grew up as a young Christian, you know, there were certain uh, restrictions on dancing, uh, listening to secular music, and so on, watching movies, and all those kind of things. There were a lot of restrictions. And so there were these kind of rules, uh, which if you kept, you're a better Christian. You're getting what I'm saying? I, I do, does this, is this something you all experience or? Yeah, okay, good. You know, and so even in the world, we see people try to do works to kind of earn the pleasure of God or to get the pleasure of God. What do they do? They do good works, charitable deeds. They would get into moral living. They would observe various religious laws and rituals uh, in order to get there. They would get into penance and sacrifices. These things are what you observe around you. They go for long pilgrimages. You know, there are some pilgrimages where they beat themselves with these, you know, with, with the whip. You know, and some of them have these blades which cut into their skin and all those things. Why? Because they want to pay for their sins. And they end up doing all those things. You know, there is this whole concept of karma that is there. Where the more good work you do, the more pleasure you bring to God. Now, what happens when you don't meet those standards? What happens when you don't do your quiet time? There is guilt. There is shame. Yeah. When you, I mean, I, who, I, I think Alan mentioned, Alan was the one who led worship. He mentioned, you know, when he was leading worship, that when we commit a sin, it's difficult to worship God. Why is that? Because we are feeling guilt. We are feeling shame. And we don't feel the confidence to come before God at that point of time. It's difficult because we are still reeling under this whole thing about that we sinned, we did something wrong, and I now need to earn my way back to God's presence by probably doing a list of things that make me feel good enough that now I can come in my confidence. Okay? I need to do sufficient works to be able to come back into God's presence. And so when we don't keep these works, there is guilt and shame. There is fear. Am I going to lose my salvation? There is insecurity about the whole aspect. Does God still love me? Is God disappointed in me? And so on. There is frustration because I cannot keep this. It's difficult to keep these seven. How am I going to keep all the rest? You know, and we fail to keep that. And there is a sense of frustration that I'm not able to walk on this path. I'm not able to go this mile. It is difficult. And that leads to then hopelessness. Because what hope do I have if I'm not able to keep these things? Yeah? There is isolation because now I feel I'm separated from God. I feel I'm not able to keep this so then I may also get isolated from the church or from other Christians because every time I come before them, they would talk about, you know, a lot of things that make me feel I don't measure up. So there can be isolation which can also go to loneliness. It can then go to resentment and bitterness because why did God put all these requirements on me? I, I'm not all these things. And so I, we become resent, resentful and bitter. Ultimately, ultimately, it can go to anger and rebellion. You say, you know, all this is not right. I just don't want to follow all of this. Does that make sense? We all, you know, 
most of the world struggles with these things because there is this burden of works upon us we ought to fulfill all this criteria in order to supposedly please god and please people around us now i you know when we look at the christian life there are four questions you know i want to look at but we'll just start with two you know this will help us look at this whole concept of righteousness of christ and we look at two things active and passive righteousness i will explain those terms as i go forward but let's look at these questions we'll start with two okay if you were to die tonight and stand before god do you know for certain that he would take you into heaven no some is something yes some thing no fair enough you know uh, if you were to die tonight and you were to stand before god do you know for certain that he could take you into heaven yeah it's a question that's frequently used in evangelism uh, to reach out to people uh, and then the answer is given let's look at the next question if you were to stand before god tonight and he were to say to you why should i take you into my heaven what do you think you would say to him no <laughs> that was a good one <laughs> brilliant you know that that's amazing <laughs> <laughs> so yeah i mean i'll i'll stand just with you when you're there <laughs> you know by the way those are helpful questions okay and if you don't know how to answer them i would encourage you uh, to please meet karan and esther please meet the leaders of this church uh, or please meet aunty <laughs> she they will help you answer this question properly okay and, but, but they are very important questions they are very important questions and it will tell you whether you have any assurance in your life or not about this whole matter you know but i think we need to ask ourselves two other questions as we journey in our christian walk let's look at the third one what does god think of you right now what does god think of you right now you know we, we some of you may have heard this song he is still working on me yeah it says he is still working on me to make me what i ought to be it took him just a week to make the moon and the stars the sun and the earth and jupiter and mars all of them working perfectly just a week sun and the earth jupiter and mars the stars all working perfectly no problem how loving and patient he must be he's still working on me right he's still a work in progress and in some way we are so messed up as well right that's what it goes on to show i still need work on me and uh, and so what does god think of you right now so as he's turning his attention from the sun and the earth and running all these planets and everything and as he turns his focus to your life and he looks to you and he looks at your life he looks at your thoughts he looks at your heart he looks at your feelings he sees your words actions emotions and as he turns to you and he contemplates your life what is the expression on his face and there's another question like it what can you do to change that what can you do to change his opinion or idea of you and i think it will be very helpful to look at these questions as we look at this aspect of active and passive righteousness now the truth is that unless you believe jesus has done enough for you unless you believe jesus has done enough for you it's going to be very difficult for you to emotionally answer these questions you're going to struggle to emotionally answer these questions uh, unless you believe that now let's look at this what does god look like from the life of christians you know why i asked those four questions is because you know in in our christian life we believe that god is our father uh, but if i were to try to suppose what the real character of god is just by looking at the life of christians suppose there was no bible suppose there was no scripture and the only way to know about god was the life of christians what do you think my understanding of god would be right this is only by looking at christians no scripture no bible but that's the only way they can know about god confused you know i think many would feel that he is very distant that god is very distant he is never to be pleased 
he is downright abusive because of the wrong kind of fear that Christians have of God. You know, some of you, you may have gone into a home and where you see children playing. Yeah, they're playing around in the house and suddenly the doorbell rings and it's the father. And all of a sudden, the, the children's reaction changes. And you see that there is a fear in the children. And you wonder what must be happening in this house. That the children are so fearful when the father comes home. You know, what kind of environment is here? And often I think that when some non-Christians look at the life of Christians, more than what their mouths say, they look at what their lives say, and they might be thinking, what kind of God is it whom we serve, who is so far away, so difficult to please, so promising of heaven, and so distant in this world? He's promising of heaven, but he's distant here, while we are here. You know, at least what do our lives say about it? And so we look at this aspect of active and passive righteousness. And I think when we look at passive righteousness, you know, this whole concept will give us some assurance uh, about our relationship that we have with God. And so what we're going to do is, we're going to look at Romans chapter 3, you know, uh, over here. Uh, I think I may have the verse on screen. Uh, no, I don't. Okay. We're going to look at Romans chapter 3, but when I come there, you know, when I'm using these words, active and passive righteousness, all I'm doing is I'm quoting the same words used by Martin Luther in his preface uh, to his commentary on the book of Galatians. So he says there are two kinds of righteousness. There's a righteousness that you make or create by yourself or with God's help, but it's your righteousness. So if you came to church today on time, that's your righteousness. If you finished your work at office on time, that's your righteousness. If you served your wife well and took care of her needs, your righteousness. You're doing it either on your own or you're doing it with God's help. And then it says, and there's another righteousness that comes from God. This is not from you. This comes from God. It says there's a righteousness that you actively manufacture. And there's a righteousness that you passively receive. And this is, by the way, biblical language. And so we're going to look at Romans 3.21. And so what does it say here? It says, but now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify. So it says now, apart from the, apart from the law, a righteousness of God. So there is a righteousness. Whose is it? God's righteousness. It is apart from the law, which means it's apart from your obedience to the law, apart from your active obedience to those, probably those seven things which I listed out, do not do in the tongue assignment, apart from whatever you have done to obey different instructions or commands in the Bible, apart from the law, a righteousness of God has been made known to which the law and the prophets are testifying. So when you look at the law and you look at the prophets, what they are saying is that apart from me, apart from what I am saying, there is a righteousness of God which is going to be made known. This is not righteousness that comes from your keeping of the law of, or from your obedience. Okay, This is a righteousness of God that comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. Okay, this is a righteousness. Did you do anything to get it? No. It's a righteousness that comes through faith in Christ Jesus to all who believe. It's a righteousness I receive passively. You know what is the difference between active and passive? Yes, active is where you're doing something. Passive is you're just there. You know, you don't do anything over there. Now, Luther says it is like the ground receives the rain. Now, what does the ground do to receive the rain? Does it jump up and down? Cultivates the soil. But does it do anything to receive the rain? Nothing at all. There may be an earthquake, but last I checked, earthquakes are not known to produce rains. Right? So the ground cannot do anything to receive the rain. And so this righteousness is received passively like the ground receives the rain, you know. And so, this is the righteousness 
which is apart from the law of God to which the law and the prophets are testifying. And so I need this righteousness if I have to survive. I need this righteousness if I have to stand before God. If I were to tell you that it is Christ plus good works that will get you into heaven, what, what would you say? True or false? False. Okay, good. You passed the exam. All right. Now these days I'm teaching my daughter a lot because the exams are coming up. So a lot of these true and false questions are there. So good to say many of you said false. You know, and I'm glad that you said it is not Christ plus good works. It is Christ alone. You know, what is it that gets you into heaven? It is Christ righteousness alone. It is your faith in him alone. Jesus plus nothing. You know, that's what it is. But what is the ground for your walk with God for the rest of your life? What is the ground for your walk with God for the rest of your life? Are you saved by faith and then continue in another way? Are you saved by faith and then continue by works? You, is that your starting point and then your continuing point? You know? No. We continue the same way we start. You know, there is this whole, you were, many, so many of, all of you probably use mobile phones. You know, now we know that when we take a mobile connection, there are two types. There is prepaid and there is postpaid. Okay, so what happens in prepaid? You pay first and then you get the connection and you're able to use it for a month or three months or whatever. In postpaid, you use first, pay later. Now some people live their Christian life like the prepaid and postpaid. Some try to earn their way to God and therefore get acceptance of God. Some say, now that Jesus died for you, you're supposed to do all these things. So you pay. Either you pay before or you pay after, but you pay. You know, But that is not what the gospel is. The gospel is this, that Jesus paid. I do not have to pay. Jesus paid. All of it. And so, how do I continue in my Christian life? By the same faith. It's not that heaven is a free gift, but the rest of my Christian life is a church purgatory. You know what is purgatory? It's a, it's a concept in the Catholic church where if your good deeds and bad deeds you know, are somewhere in the middle of the scale, then you'll be sent to purgatory where neither heaven nor hell, you'll be sent to a mid place where if you do some good works, you can go to heaven. Okay, so it's not like heaven is a free gift, but this life here is a purgatory. That here it depends on what you do. Where God is displeased with you, distant with you, angry with you for the rest of your life. Now that's how many times Christians live like we said. You know, uh, they don't know how to keep the word of God. They don't know how to keep the commands of God. And they don't know how to get their conscience out from this curse of the law. And so they feel trapped. Because they know they don't measure up in the Christian life. All they can see in heaven is an angry God, a disappointed God, a displeased God. And so all they want to do is, they know they'll get to heaven, but they somehow want to make it through here. They want to get done with what is here. You know, between now and then, there is a tough time. You know, I myself, you know, I mean all of us, you know, we can testify, we struggle with sin. You know, there, are, there have been so many times when I have, you know, faltered or, or given in to a certain temptation. And it's been difficult for me to get back to God. You know, I have sometimes spent days, days or even weeks, just trying to do some things that I might feel better enough about myself. You know, and then find the ability to walk back into God's presence. You know, but that is not where the Bible says our confidence comes from. The Bible says our confidence comes because of the blood of Jesus. Today we sang, right, there's power, there's power, there's wonder-working power. That wonder-working power is what gives us confidence to enter into his courts. You know, we have a struggle, but between now and then, you know, I want you to know in this life, I have now, right here, in this place, I have now a righteousness that is not my own. Amen? You know, and it's not just effective for heaven. It bears fruit now in my life. 
you know and so when i stand before you today i'm not perfect i'm far from perfect when i look at myself i don't stand here perfect i have a lot of flaws probably some flaws committed today morning itself you know i don't stand perfect in any way even here as i stand in in the human sense i stand corrupt but in god's eyes i stand perfect i stand perfect having a righteousness not because of what i have done but because of what someone else has done and so i stand here righteous you are seated here righteous why did you tell that to the person beside you you are seated here righteous now that's been something very difficult for my heart to get around okay it's been something very difficult my head understands it are you with me my head understands it but what we are talking about here is the difference between a head theology and a heart theology you know we may know a lot of bible verses promises passages we may know a lot of that we may have read it many a times probably memorized it maybe you can quote it maybe there are some bible scholars here and so on i know that you know it in your head even i know it in my head but what i'm asking is what flows out of your heart with respect to this issue what flows out of your heart what is your heart theology that will say more than anything else what does god think of you today your answer to that will begin to expose your heart theology what does god think of you today and what can you do to change that your answer to that will show what righteousness you are trusting other than jesus is you follow that because if you can do anything to change the opinion of god you are trusting in your righteousness i hope that makes sense it says but now righteousness from god apart from the law has been made known to which the law and the prophets testify now there are two parts of the gospel yeah and i think uh, we know one part very well but many christians don't know the second part very well you know and so and so here it is you know we know on one hand we are us over there wretched sinners uh, our life is messed up we we know we don't measure up there is a lot of problem there is a lot of sinfulness uh, we tend to fail many times uh, on these aspects and so we are on one side over there wretched sinners and on the other side there is a loving savior okay who is jesus and he has he is perfect you know he has done nothing wrong we over here have this terrible record like i said if somebody were to write a book of our sins you know john said if you were to write about jesus the pages of you know the paper on earth would not suffice that's what john said you know sometimes i feel if somebody were to write about my sins it would be the same thing you know and uh, so here on one hand we have this terrible record that's there you know and when i put my faith in jesus when i put my faith in jesus what happens this terrible record is passed on to jesus and it goes and it is nailed to the cross we are forgiven you know that's what aunty prayed today when she came forward she said thank you i am messed up i am forgiven and i'm so glad praise god my sins are washed away you know i am white as snow i am cleansed of my sinfulness right that's what aunty prayed but this is the second part of the gospel which many a times we tend to forget jesus also had a record as much as we had a record jesus had a record it was perfect he did not do in one sin he was the spotless lamb absolutely pure he did not commit any sin but he also did all that was supposed to be done on our behalf you know there are acts of sins of omission uh, commission and sins of omission commission is when you do something wrong omission is when you don't do that which is right jesus did not have either of those kind of sins he did not do that which was wrong and he did everything that was right and on the cross when we put our faith in jesus that perfect record is transferred transferred to us hallelujah it's legal it's more legal than any court of law on the face of the earth it's legal i have the perfect record of jesus on my account 
a righteousness of God, of Jesus, apart from the law, to which the law and the prophets were testifying, has been made known. And it is yours and mine today. Praise God. Does the Bible teach that? I think it does. It says, now usually we are fine with just one part of it, right? But you heard the second part of it. What does it say in Romans 4.3? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as forgiveness. No? Yeah, I purposely wrote forgiveness there. It's not forgiveness. It is righteousness. Why did I put forgiveness there? Because that's where we are content. That's where we put a full stop. That's not what scripture says. Scripture says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. You know, we should not settle for less. Forgiveness is great. Auntie, righteousness is even better. It's even better. Yeah. Uh, now many of you are married here. You know, I'd like to ask any husband a question. Any husband would want to volunteer just putting their hands up. All the husbands are scared. Anyone? Okay, everybody's pointing to Kevin. I don't know why. <laughs> you seem to be the Ivan of that Russian church. <laughs> okay, Evan, would you, Kevin, would you like to volunteer? Okay. So you're a, you're a married man. Now, have you ever got into an argument with your wife? Yes? Okay, let's clap for him. He's an honest man over there. Yeah? Now, in that argument, when you're having the argument, okay, right in the middle of the argument, would you rather be forgiven or would you be right? You would like to be right. Yeah, that's again, you know, because that's the whole reason you're having the argument in the first place, right? You're not having the argument because I want to be forgiven. You're having the argument because you want to be right. Yeah, and so here God is giving you righteousness. He's not just giving you forgiveness. Isn't that something to be treasured? Yeah, that's something to be treasured. I want to be right before God. I just don't want to be forgiven. Forgiveness is wonderful. Righteousness is even better. I have a righteousness that is not my own. And it commends me to God. It commends me to God. Because of this righteousness, just as Jesus was before the Father on, at the time of his baptism, and God said, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. God is able to look at us as well in that same manner and say, this is my son or daughter in whom I am well pleased. Why? Not because of what we have done, but because his righteousness clothes us. And so we become children of God in whom God is well pleased. Not disappointed, not angry, not upset, not put off with, but well pleased. That is what the word of God says. You know, that's what makes me acceptable before God. That's what makes him delight in me. Not just be accepted, but it makes God delight in me. Because I'm clothed with the righteousness of Jesus. That's good news. That's the gospel. Doesn't that lift a weight off your shoulder? That's good news. That's why God called it the good news, right? You're not just forgiven, you're made righteous over here. Now when I don't hold on to this truth, and I'm only content with forgiveness, and I don't hold on to this truth, what happens? I still have a need of righteousness. And that's the reason why we get into so many works. So I still have a need of righteousness. So then I bring in my own righteousness. And we saw today what our own righteousness does. The tongue assignment was a simple illustration of that. No wonder God says, your righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Because nothing other than the righteousness of Jesus can satisfy God. Our righteousness is like filthy rags, it says in Isaiah 64, 6. That's bad news if we want to live this way. So the question is, do we want to live the good news life or the bad news life? You know, my heart is still grabbing a hold of these things. It's still, you know, something that needs to sink in. It still has to go from year to year. And it's going in part. And, and, and as that happens on a regular basis, God is changing me. 
as that happens regularly. It's changing the way I approach God. And it's making a difference to my heart. Now what does it say again? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now this word credited is a banking term. Yeah, I mean, uh, suppose all of you have bank accounts here. Now when you, in your bank account, you will see in your statement there is debit, there is credit and so on. Now if you were to issue a check and say uh, that check is of an amount which is more than what is there in your bank balance, what will happen? The check will bounce. And what is the message that you will get in your statement? Insufficient funds. Very good. This is coming from experience. Uh, now, now I don't understand the deal with the bank. Okay, when when a check bounces, all right, and uh, and there is less money in your account. Okay, uh, that's why the check bounced. And so, because you don't have money in your account, what does the bank do? They take more money. You know, अरे इधर तो पैसा है नहीं. I don't have money. And the penalty for not having money is give more money. You know, and so I don't understand that deal with the bank. You know, uh, I'm already in a hole. I didn't ask for their help. But they come in, dig the hole a little more deeper. You know, to the point that I can't come out. You know, over here. Now, now, su now suppose I go to the bank and I tell them, look, I know I messed up. I'm sorry. I bounced 70 checks. Yeah. But if you're going to charge me 600 rupees per bounce check, that's 43,000 bucks. I'm never going to come out of this hole. You know, and so I say, please forgive me. And so for, say for some reason they have mercy on me and they, you know, and they forgive me and they say, okay, we will not charge you what you don't have. Okay, and I'm so grateful and I'm saying, thank you. You know, I'm, I'm, uh, you know, I'm saying hallelujah, praise the Lord. And I'm really excited, you know, my debt is forgiven. I'm no longer in debt to anybody. What's the uh, balance in my account right now? Zero. And I'm relieved. I don't owe anyone anything. But you know what credited righteousness is? It is the, all the money of Jesus' merit in my bank account. I don't now have a zero balance. I don't have a zero balance. I now have a riches. I'm rich. I have the riches of a righteousness that I never earned. And it's credited to my account legally. A zero balance is forgiveness, but this is righteousness. Credited to my account, which I just did not have. You know, imagine the bank is now not only forgiving my bounce checks, whatever faulty checks I issued, they are paying, wishing payments for that also. Amazing, right? Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. Doesn't that Set your heart free. Praise God. That's what he has done. He has set us free. He has set us free. What we do, we receive it by faith. Passively. It is just receive it by faith. You know, that has begun to change my gospel approach and my testimony. You know, there was a poor joy in my previous approach. Why? Because, you know, let me just, let me just say this. Uh, now, if you're saved, as a, if you're a Christian over here and it's been more than a decade, uh, with time what happens? Your testimony becomes dimmer, okay? Uh, because it's something that happened so many years ago, right? It, it, like, it's not like a fresh thing which is now here. It becomes dimmer and dimmer with time, you know? But today, I have a new story. Jesus has done something for me today. He has forgiven my sin today. He has given me a righteousness today. You know, heaven is a free gift. It is a free gift. But our relationship with God today also is a free gift. I don't have to earn it. And it is based on the righteousness that I receive by faith. You know, every day, you know, we, we talk about uh, some of us take take loans, right? And so, what happens? You pay an interest. Uh, but what do you, what is that which you pay every month called EMI? Years you get you get an EDI. 
an everyday installment from God of his forgiveness and his righteousness. Credit it to your account. You know, this is what God is doing for you. He gave you his, he forgave you this week. He gave you his righteousness this week. Now, how my, this is also changing the way my testimony sounds. Now, how would my testimony sound? Uh, earlier, you know, when I would meet people, I would tell them, I used to be as messed up as you are. I was a real mess. But then I found Jesus. And you, if you receive Jesus, your life can become like mine. Problem? Does that sound good? Sorry? Does that sound good? No. You know, what I'm doing is, I'm exalting myself over here. Because I'm saying you can be as good as I am. I'm not saying you can have this forgiveness of Jesus and you can receive the life that Jesus has to offer. But I would never say those exact words, but that is the sense that would come off my testimony. You know, uh, sometimes this even can come across in discipleship. You know, one, one, one wrong way of doing discipleship is saying, making our disciples like us. When we want them to become like us. See how I am doing this? You can also do it. See the price I am paying? You can also pay it. You know, as opposed to making them like Jesus. But when I trust in my own righteousness, that's what I can do. That's what I would end up doing in my witness and in my discipleship. But now, my testimony would sound something like this. Would you come with me today, with me, with me, today to a God who gives righteousness for faith in Jesus? And so we are on a journey together to receive Jesus. Now, even as I'm coming close to an end, you know, we all still need an active righteousness. We have to deal with that issue. We spoke about passive, but we also said there is something called as active righteousness. And we all still need that. You know, I don't want you to be mistaken. I'll give you an example. Today I came from the expressway. And suppose I crossed, what is the speed limit? 100. Suppose I cross 100 and I'm driving at 120, 140. What will happen? I'll get a chalan. Now I can plead with them as much as I want. I'm forgiven in Christ. I'm righteous in Christ. You know, Jesus paid it all. I can do all that, but they're still going to put a fine on me. Right? Am I correct? So I still need an active righteousness. You know, that's the way the world works. That is exactly the way the world works. You know, I have to have a righteousness before the state. I have to keep those laws. I cannot break laws left, right, and center. Yeah? I have to have a righteousness before my wife and my daughter. You know, a husband cannot keep beating his wife and say, I'm forgiven. That's wickedness. Yeah? I need it in society. Suppose I came to your, came over here today without brushing my teeth. What would happen? Many of you would stay away from me. Why? Because I've broken a social norm. I need to have that right. I need to get that right, isn't it? It's very important. And so you need it at home. You need it with your family. You need it at work. You need it in society. You know, suppose I don't go to work from tomorrow. And they call me up and I say, Jesus has finished the work. What will they tell me? Salary is also going there only. <laughs> You know, we're dedicating it over there. And I'll lose my job also. Right? So I need a righteousness uh, over there. And so the Bible encourages that. The Bible does encourage that. So you need to be the best citizen that you can be. You need to be the best worker, husband, wife, parent, child, citizen, elder, congregation member. You need to do your best in each of them. But when you stand before God, when you stand before God, you stand before Him in a righteousness that is not your own. Does that make sense? When you stand before God, you stand in a righteousness not your own. But when you stand before people, when you stand before the world, you need an act of righteousness. That is absolutely essential. It is also uh, your testimony before people in some ways. It is essential. Before God, I stand in a passive righteousness. Before the world, I need an act of righteousness in this life. You know, I want to be paid a salary. 
I don't want speeding tickets. But let me tell you, how do we get that active righteousness? Our passive righteousness leads to our active righteousness. Okay, I hope you get that. Our passive righteousness that we receive in Christ leads us to walk with a new act of obedience. It is this passive righteousness that I've got that leads me to walk in obedience towards God. You know, Jesus, I mean, I did say the Bible encourages that. God also wants us to walk in holiness. We do see enough of scripture about that to, you know, guide us on those issues. It's not something which is what we don't know. Now, when God points out, does the Holy Spirit, okay, let's ask a question. When you commit a sin, does the Holy Spirit convict you? Yes? So the fact is that God is showing you something. So when God's showing us something, do we need to pay attention to it? Yes. Let's look at, I'm going to read from Hebrews 12, 5 to 11, and what it says over there. That's very important. It's not on the screen, so if you want to refer to your Bibles, you can do that. Hebrews 12, 5 to 11. And have you completely forgotten this word of encouragement that addresses you as a father, addresses his son? It says, my son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline and do not lose heart when he rebukes you because the Lord disciplines the one he loves and he chastens everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? If you are not disciplined and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are not legitimate, not true sons and daughters at all. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of spirits and live? They disciplined us for a little while as they thought best. But God disciplines us for our good. Why? In order that we may share in his holiness. So does God want us to share in his holiness? It's clear. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness. This is the active righteousness part that we are talking about. So you see, there is a harvest that's coming of active righteousness through the Lord's discipline. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Let's look at this quote by the author John Murray in his book, Redemption Accomplished and Applied. He says, it would be a terrible mistake to confuse the chastisement that comes to a beloved son with the punishment of a sinner. Okay, I'll, I'll let you get your head around that. The ones who have come as a beloved son have come to Christ. Those two things are not equal. Let me explain it here on the next slide. A son or a daughter is, let me hear it, disciplined. A sinner who has not come to Christ is punished. If you are a son or a daughter today, you will never be punished. Why? Because all your punishment is taken upon the cross of Christ. Do you get that? Will you be disciplined? Yes. Why? Because you are a dearly beloved child of God. So now when we undergo discipline, do we and when we sin, do we need to stay away from God? Or do we need to run into the Father's arms? Because He is disciplining us. He is pruning us. I love my daughter and nothing that she can do will change that. She will always be my daughter. And I will always, in that sense, want to forgive her of every wrong that she does. I know that's the experience I've had with my parents. There are so many times I've disappointed them. There are so many times I've said things against them to their face, insulted them, done what not. But they always loved me. They always stood with me. Did they correct me? Yes. Why? Because they love me. Does God want us to share in His holiness? Why? Because He loves us. You know, and we need to get around to that. So we should never mistake a discipline which comes from a father as a punishment of a God who is disappointed in you. 
you know there is a difference between the two you know active righteousness is an evidence of passive righteousness in my life it's an evidence of passive righteousness now some of you may say you know i understand this i have passive righteousness before god he fully accepts me as i am i stand in that passive righteousness before god fully forgiven not only forgiven but also made righteous before the world i need an active righteousness but i'm sure there's one issue which is troubling you what about those sins which you commit in private that doesn't affect the world but it's between you and god right hmm you're not dealt with that issue now when we look at that you know what jesus says he says if you love me you will obey my commandments right now how are we saved we are saved by faith we are saved by faith now salvation includes three parts which is justification which means i am not guilty made righteous there is sanctification which is where god is making me holy day by day so that i can share in his holiness and it includes glorification which is when i meet jesus face to face one day so there is justification there is sanctification there is glorification if salvation is by faith that means justification is by faith sanctification is by is by faith because salvation is by faith justification is by faith sanctification is also by faith and glorification is by faith how do i grow in holiness faith in what jesus has done on the cross if i am not able to walk in that holiness where is the problem lie in my active works or does it lie in my faith so if faith is lacking how do i grow it the word of god that's what the word of god tells us faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of god if i am lacking the ability to obey where do i run to for faith the word of god that will give me the faith to therefore obey what does the psalmist say i have hidden your word in my heart that i might not sin against you the word of god is clear on this issue if i am lacking in love which is another motivating factor for obedience what did jesus say of the woman who poured the perfume on his feet she loves much because she has been forgiven much so if i am lacking love i need to look again to the cross for the forgiveness of jesus and know how much more i have been forgiven the more i have an understanding of my sinfulness and god's forgiveness the more my appreciation for the cross would grow and the more my love would grow i need love and faith to grow in this kind of obedience how do i gain faith the word of god how do i gain love the cross of christ and that would enable us to walk that way with god let's close by looking at this last verse hebrews 10 14 it's a very important verse as i close for by let's read it together for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy now this may sound like a contradiction of all sorts it says for by one sacrifice he has made perfect forever so if it is perfect forever what is the need of them being made holy so he has made perfect forever which means he has given us his righteousness but being made holy is the active righteousness how are both accomplished by one sacrifice amen amen let's look to god in prayer you know as i pray if any of you feel over here that this is an issue you've been struggling with if any of you feel over here that you have not felt worthy before god that you felt you don't measure up you feel i'm a disappointment god is not happy with me i'm far away from god's standards i try but i can't do it 
or if you feel you have struggled with struggling with some sin and you just can't find the courage to go back to god and if you want to make that decision after what you have heard today to take that step of faith because you know what we need we need faith in the gospel we need faith in the word we need love which comes as we understand the forgiveness of god if you feel you're in that place i would encourage you to just stand as an expression of your faith